Yo, what's up, people? Ryan Den here. It's October 4th. We're jumping into our Zoom groups tonight every first and third Sunday of the month. You guys are going to watch this video. It's going to be a lesson video, and then we're going to jump into Zoom groups. We're going to have fun games, activities. Join us. Um, then we're going to jump into our small groups. It's going to be really, really good. You guys need to check out this video, though, before you come, or you're not going to know what's going on. This video is our lesson series called No Apologies week one and the reason why we're doing this is this series is meant to focus on what other religions believe versus your faith your religion your faith in god and so we're going to be diving in this today this is really important you may have asked yourself you know, like why are we going over what other religions believe and not just focusing on the bible well think about it like this you probably have friends, family members, or a teacher that have different beliefs than you, and you maybe are scared to death about answering their questions about why you believe what you believe, why you believe what you believe in God. And so we're going to be diving in this today. And my goal is for you guys to be more comfortable and more confident in what you believe. So hang on, like plant yourself in your chair, get some water, pause this video if you need to, get some water, get some food sit down, get ready to unpack this because what we're talking about today is extremely important. Yo, and it is going to make you feel so much better. You're going to feel so much better, so much more confident at the end of this lesson. So check this out. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that's in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Like, guys, we got to be confident. We got to be bold when we talk to other people of different beliefs. But at the same time, for some reason, when Christians get into conversations with non-Christians, maybe you've experienced this before, or maybe you've seen it before, we sometimes feel like the goal when we're talking to people who aren't Christian is to win the argument. And we end up not leading them towards Christ or anywhere closer to God. I have never heard someone say, man, gee, like this dude embarrassed me with his logic about science and the Bible. And so I became a believer. What I have heard is a person took the time to lovingly show me the way to Jesus. I'm like, guys, like we're not going to end up being jerks with this info. We're going to love people rather and be confident in our faith and our answers about our faith. So if this is super important to you, I really do think it is. I think this is going to help you with your friendships. I think it's going to help you with family. I think it's going to help you um, talking to your teacher that's an atheist. Like it's going to be so good. Um, strap in, pay attention. You're really not going to want to miss out on this. So today we're going to talk about people who consider themselves non-religious, um, atheists, agnostics, skeptics. All right. So these are individuals with a lack of belief in God or the supernatural. All right, so check this out. A better way to understand this would be skeptics would say, I doubt that God exists. Maybe you have friends that, that believe that. Agnostics would say, I don't know if God exists. And atheists would say, God just straight up does not exist. All right, uh, I would venture to guess that most people at your school are agnostic. And you yourself might be agnostic. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, Christianity is good. I go to church every Sunday, but it's really my parents' faith. It's not really my faith. Um, I'm really not sure what I believe. Maybe like you're in that agnostic boat. All right. I remember agnostics believe, or they would say, I do not know if God exists. I'm just not sure if God exists or if he even has a place in my life for any kind of influence. So this is because most people I'd say are agnostic and because they're probably not confident enough to say that there isn't any God, but they also aren't sure if there is a God. All right. So they're not sure if there is no God, but they're also not sure if there is a God. Additionally, they may feel like it is impossible to really know if God exists or they just don't care one way or another. So we're going to look at um, just three objections people have with Christianity. All right, so three things people are like, mm, like Christians, I don't, know, I don't really agree with you, I don't really agree with you. Really three objections that people have with Christianity. Check this out. Disclaimer, all right, before we start this, there are countless reasons why people are atheists, agnostics, skeptics, but I just want to focus on the three that I think your friends are actually dealing with. So first objection, hasn't science disproved God? Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you believe that. 
some of it. Here's eight points a pastor in North Carolina, this J.D. Gurr guy, he wrote this, check this out. Number one, how does science disprove God? Well, what points us to God is the fact that materialism doesn't satisfy us. You guys, all right, gals, on your smartphones and gadgets and tablets, like you're playing Minecraft or Fortnite, at some point in your life, you've probably got tired of a new video game or a new piece of clothing or, you know, like you've, you've enjoyed something, but then it broke. It didn't last forever. You outgrew it. You, it was a phase. Um, maybe you physically outgrew that outfit that you used to love. Materialism does not satisfy us. Things do not satisfy us. When we give what we want, we are still not satisfied. Or over time, those things, they just go away, right? We want eternity in a temporary world. Everything about this world is temporary but we want eternity. When this happens, it really is that our hearts are longing for God. Why? Because God's not temporary. His love is not temporary. And what God set up for the world, he really wants to be eternal. All right. So the world, temporary, materialistic, you know, things that we get, things that we have, things that we buy, whatever. But God, eternal. All right. Our hearts are longing for that. Two, there's a problem of human rights in the accidental universe all right so this idea that the universe is made by accident science has proven it blah 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 you know if everything was an accident and we are here by chance then why would we be upset at hitler pause shock in awe right did ryan just say that like think about that for a second hitler right nazi germany concentration camps killing millions of jewish people why do we feel that certain things are not fair if there isn't a higher court of what makes justice. Like if, if there's not a God who's setting up justice and what morality is, what views there are, why would something like Hitler even matter? Martin Luther King Jr., he talked about how the reason we know that current laws about segregation are wrong was because it conflicted with the higher law of God. So like the only reason why civil rights or freedom for the Jews in concentration camps would matter is God simply made it matter. Science doesn't have an answer for that. All right, the power of love and beauty points us to God. Science doesn't have a reason for love and beauty. There's no reason for love and beauty in evolution, but love is just considered a chemical reaction in the brain, right? Yet, think about love and beauty. It plays such a big part, a big role in our lives. There has to be more of this life and simply preparing to become food for worms, right? Like you love, like, you know, like these things matter, man. It goes beyond just science. Here's another one I got for you. Let's check this out. The persistence of Christianity and history also points to Scott. There's this dude named Voltaire, not to be confused with Voldemort, all right? Voltaire, he, he predicted that Christianity would be extinct in a hundred years of his death in 1778 all right ironically 100 years later you want to have it to his house it became a printing press printing guess what bibles all right this dude he thought that christianity would not exist 100 years 100 years later his house is printing bibles all right needless to say the church man isn't going extinct it might look like it's going downhill like in north america but in fact it's flourishing on places like china in South America, the church isn't going anywhere. People have tried to predict, you know, the church is, church is dying, blah, blah, blah. Like, man, like God's church is on the move. It ain't going anywhere. All right. Number five, there's the question of the origin of the universe. All right. So this one, like, it might hurt your head to think about this because sometimes it hurts my head. All right. Because I don't like to think about the idea of like a long time ago, there's just like nothingness. All right, now we got that out of the way. Check this out. So the question is simple about the origin of the universe. It's hot, the big bang. It all started from a single point. When it exploded, the universe of Noah began to exist. But that statement then leads itself to this question. Where did that single point originally come from? Think about it for a second. Well, if that happened, what caused that? The cause part, all right, the why. Why did this all happen? Science isn't interested in answering that question. Would you believe me if I told you there was an explosion that happened in the bathroom? But I could tell you nothing about it. 
when it happened, who saw it, the result of it, or how it started science, often doesn't answer the why and focuses a lot on the how. All right, they're like, yo, there was this big bang, things happened. Like, it misses out on the why. God comes in and fills the gap with the why. Without the why, everything is just purposeless. It's random. Um, one, of my, one of my professors at college, he's like, here's the problem with this idea of a big bang. This big orchestrative moment where nothing, things were just like put into existence. We believe the Bible got spoken into existence. All right. He was like, imagine putting a clock, a broken clock in a box and shaking it violently and just expecting there to be a fully functioning fixed clock after shaking it enough. That's like the idea that like you and I are here because of this orchestrated, unorchestrated, purposeless, sporadic random event that happened that started everything. Science does not answer the question of why. God comes in and fills the gap with why. Without the why, Everything is purposeless and random. If science is the only thing we are believing in, life is bleak. God gives us the understanding of the how, why, purpose in this world. All right. God does not conflict with science. God fills in the rest. So the prophecy is the Old Testament. So next point. The prophecy of the Old Testament also points us to Jesus being God. Did you know there are 353 prophecies of Jesus fulfilled? Things were written before Jesus was born about Jesus coming true, 353. Some of them could have been coincidences, but some of them are too specific to be by chance, like impossible. The odds of one person fulfilling all of them is 10 to the 157th power. A big old number, all right? You have a better chance of winning the lottery a couple times than any one of these prophecies one not 353 coming true which we know historically they came true one coming true about jesus that's some encouragement y'all like that's some encouragement the historical evidence about my history historical evidence that the resurrection of jesus happened cannot be denied basically between the eyewitness accounts and historical evidence that we have access to the resurrection account is hard to deny. You might have had a friend who said, you know, there's no way that, you know, there's empty tune, blah, blah. Like there's just no evidence, but there's historical evidence that it really did happen. A completely unique message of Christianity points to the existence of God. So Christianity is the only religion that says I'm accepted. Therefore I obey. We believe that God loved us First, so we have this opportunity to choose to love God. All the religions, man, every other religion in the world is different from Christianity. Christianity itself is unique because all the religions are based on your effort and obedience. Muslims, man, they have these pillars of faith you have to achieve. Buddhism, it's enlightenment and stages and all this stuff, right? Like all these other religions believe that you have to do these certain things to win God's love and acceptance or to become like God, and then you can be. You know, but Christianity says, God's just like, hey, I accept you. You're broken. You're a sinner. You're messed up. But I accept you. And man, like, because of what God's done for me, I choose to follow him. That's a beautiful thing. And that's Christianity. It stands apart because it's based on what God did, not what we do. Only other, only faith like that. A second question, question we might hear, besides the whole science thing, was Jesus even a real person? Was Jesus even a real person? What is the biblical evidence that Jesus was historically real? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all independent writers giving an account of what they saw about Jesus. They have tons of eyewitness reports of other people that saw Jesus. We also have all of Paul's writings. There are no reputable scholars. That means like someone, a scholar who's reputable is like someone like who's verified. You guys, when you follow Instagram, you know someone on Instagram that's like, yo, is this dude verified? How many followers does he have? Like, is he real? Um, if you want to go like Airbnb or TCYC, you know, we rent these Airbnbs, right? Um, a verified person who's, who has their house up for other people to sleep at overnight and like vacation in an Airbnb. Um, I only pick ones that are verified. It means like they have a government ID, a driver's license, a passport, social media accounts, their phone number's been double-checked. All these things have been cross-checked to make sure this is a real person, their house is a real location, they actually own their house, and they're using it 
for people to rent out and sleep at overnight while they're on vacation or for work or whatever. Like I only use houses like that for CCYC because I want to make sure it's safe and secure. And we're not being scammed or anything, right? It's so like when you think about that, reputable scholars, the same thing. You can go on Google and you might read an article that said Jesus never really actually existed, but I guarantee you it wasn't written by a reputable scholar, a verified scholar, right? A verified scholar would never doubt that Jesus actually existed because he did. Furthermore, there are at least a dozen or more references by non-Christian writers who mention Jesus in their writings. Tacitus, or this is a dude named Tacitus, uh, historian, Roman historian, for example, in the early second century, wrote about Emperor Nero, the Roman emperor, his persecution, he was killing Christians, torturing them. And he explains this. Tacitus says this about Nero and Christianity. He says the founder of this name, Christ, Jesus had been executed in the reign of Tiberius by the procurator Pontius Pilate. He doesn't say it's speculated. He doesn't say, hey, this is a maybe. He says this really did happen. <clears throat> and this isn't a guy writing about it hundreds of years later. All right, he was a first century historian around the time of Jesus. The fact that anyone talked about Jesus is crazy unless he really did something amazing. Think about it. There are YouTubers and other social media personalities who were a huge deal a year ago. They were a fad a year ago that we don't even talk about anymore. Jesus must have meant something different to be talked about 2,000 years later. We have more information about Jesus that was written closer to his life on earth than we do about even someone like Alexander the Great. Yet, no one doubts Alexander's existence. Like you can read about me in history books. Those of you in the middle school are about to read about Alexander, the great Romans, the Greeks, <clears throat> everything that Alexander did. And yet there's more stuff written about Jesus. I'm not even just talking about in the Bible. I'm talking about in the world. I'm talking about people who don't even believe in Christianity. Let's say Jesus really did exist. There's more evidence about Jesus than there is about Alexander. So Jesus is an historical person and real scholars, verified scholars, no, this is true. Anybody that is anybody, somebody worth listening to would tell you that Jesus was real. The third point. All right, so we got science. We got history. We got all these cool things. If you're still sticking around with me, if you're still listening, tuning in, check this out. The third point, some agnostics, people that say, I just don't know if there's a God or if he has anything to do with me. The third point that some agnostics struggle with is believing in God because of all the evil in the world. And this is a really good point. We hear of hate crimes, school shootings, war all over the world. I think that what makes people question God the most, though, is personal tragedy. Maybe someone you know is diagnosed with cancer. Maybe you know someone you loved who died in a car accident or something else happens. It's painful or tragic to sit there and try to understand why God would allow this type of evil to happen makes people confused, angry. A professor at Notre Dame, he said this, I'm gonna explain it, it's a little wordy in his professor talk, but just stick with me. He says this, it is possible that God, even being omnipotent, could not create a world with free creatures who never chose evil. Furthermore, it is possible that God, even being omnibenevolent, omnibenevolent, that's a really big word, would desire to create a world which contains evil if moral goodness requires free moral creatures. I'm going to sum this up, so check this out. In other words, God wants his people to love and worship him freely. He wants them to have this free will choice. He doesn't want to force them to love and worship him. He gives humanity free will. This is the problem. All right. This is the big issue that people have with God. They look at Adam and Eve. They look at our choice. They look at all this stuff and they're like, why do bad things happen to good people? God did not want to make the choice for you to live for him, to make the right choice, to not be in sin. He wanted you to have the free will because without free will, there's no such thing as love. All right. God gives humanity free will. In free will, humanity has the option to do good. They have the option also to do evil. So because humankind has free will, they do evil, and so evil exists in the world. This is the story of humanity. God could 
he could have made a world where people didn't do evil, but that would also mean that they wouldn't have free will. So in order for us to have free will, there is a risk of evil being in the world. And because of God, and this is the kicker, one day evil will no longer exist. That's the story of scripture. That's the story of Jesus. All right, so let me end with this. I think answering questions are great. I think answering questions about science, history, um, the problem with evil, they're great, but it isn't the complete solution. Guys, the Bible doesn't say all my good answers will lead people to salvation. The truth is your life, all right, and this is you, all right, this is your responsibility in all this. Your life will be the first thing people ever read before they ever pick up a Bible. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. A guy named Brennan Manning wrote that. Many atheists aren't jumping towards Christianity because when they see us, the only difference they see between themselves and you are that you chose to go to church on Sundays, and that's it. That's the only difference they see in your life and my life, in their life. For many, there is nothing about our lives that makes us distinct or separate. They want to believe that Jesus is going to transform their life. But when they see you, they don't see transformation. They see someone who goes to church on Sundays, and there's nothing different between you and them. That has to change. There is a responsibility on you. You can have these answers. You can say the right things. You have to be different. So if people can't see there's anything, something different about you, how will they ever experience Jesus? I want to read this first that we read at the beginning again, and here it is. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Guys, I'm here to help you so that you can make a defense for anyone who asks you what you believe. When you have people that have come with different belief points, fam, family, friends, teachers, whoever it is, like, why do you believe in God? I want to help you give an answer. However, if your life is so much like their lives, there's nothing different about you that no one's even asking. We have to change that. I pray that your life really does reflect the change Jesus can make inside of us. That's my prayer for you, is that your life can reflect the change Jesus made for you. Yo, I can't wait to see you tonight. We're going to unpack this. This is good. If you have questions, um, thoughts, concerns, like feel, feel free to like unpack those with me or your small group leader um, in our group tonight for small groups or in private. It's good. If you have questions, if you have doubts and worries about this whole God thing, like you're not alone and it's good to have questions. It's good to process. It's good to ask questions. It's good. So I invite you to do that. Yo, can't wait to see you tonight. Um, we're going to have lots of fun too. So I hope you don't miss it. 630. See you there.